Hello, and welcome to the program. On behalf of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, I welcome you to today's presentation. My name is Andrew Olekshuk, and I will speak to you just briefly um, uh, about my background. Uh, I was born in Highland Park, Illinois. Uh, my parents were immigrants uh, from Ukraine. They came to this country as uh, children uh, after World War II. Uh, and so I learned a lot of this history in, uh, as a child. And then later as an adult, I turned uh, back to it to learn more. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so today's presentation, thousand years of Ukrainian history, as we'll see, it's a little bit more than that, uh, postmarked in Ukraine. We're gonna talk about the prehistory of Ukraine and Kyiv and Rus to the 12th century approximately. We'll talk about the middle ages in Ukrainian lands to the 17th century and then the modern history up to the contemporary period in Ukraine in the 21st century. And then uh, a few brief conclusions and we will leave it at that. Um, if you do have questions, you can uh, uh, put the, type them in the Q&A uh, area of this webinar and uh, we'll get to those questions at the end of the program. Okay, so a little bit about Ukraine. Uh, itself. Uh, it is the largest country solely in Europe, uh, has a population of uh, 42 million people. Actually, at the time I wrote this, that was even wrong. It, it was about 40 million. Um, and of course, if you've been reading the headlines recently, you know it's, it's less than that now. Um, you can see uh, here the Ukraine is just north of the Black Sea. Uh, the countries that border it are Moldova, Romania, Hungary, Slovakia, Poland, Belarus, and Russia. Um, people think that uh, France is bigger, but it's not. Uh, the uh, square mileage of Ukraine is, is the largest country in Europe, not the most populous. Okay, uh, we're going to go back to the 6th or 3rd century uh, BCE, um, before the Common Era, with Trapillian culture uh, is found uh, in the area north of the Black Sea. Uh, you can see here from stamps of Moldova and stamps of Ukraine, uh, some of the artifacts that are uh, found uh, in this area. The Trapillian culture is known for these uh, geometric uh, figures that you see. This is um, uh, some pottery uh, that's found. This is a, a, a water vessel. Um, and Trapillian culture is, is well known and well studied. If you walk into a Ukrainian gift shop, you will probably see some uh, 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 you know, newer uh, items made in this style. Uh, it's associated with uh, Ukraine and the area around there from this period. Okay, the first settlers um, from Europe actually came via the sea routes that connect it. As you know, the Mediterranean Sea is here connected to the Black Sea. Uh, here you see also uh, Byzantium or Istanbul, Constantinople, as it was called. Uh, very close to Ukraine here. Uh, the Black Sea had settlements uh, all around from uh, Greek culture. And you see you know, actual vases and, and pottery that is unearthed uh, there from this period. So the connection to Greek culture is, is there by, you know, because of the uh, water navigation. And those are even come back in modern postal history. So you see here, uh, this is a, a letter from 1910 from Odessa, and it's ad addressed to the Bank of Athens in Athens, Greece. Uh, so a more modern piece that uh, recalls those connections, so, which are still there and uh, still alive. Um, 
I'd like to diverge from history here just for a minute. Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, Conan the Barbarian uh, franchise, huge multi-million dollar franchise. This is just a little bit for fun. If you, um, you know, it, it, it's more than just the Arnold Schwarzenegger movies. It's, uh, uh, it's based on a, con you know, that you can, you can find Conan the Barbarian on, on lunch boxes, on t-shirts, the, the, the whole nine yards. Uh, it's really a huge franchise. Um, if it was originally based on a comic book, it's, it's completely fictional, the story of Conan the Barbarian, 100% uh, completely fictional. However, if you go back to the very, um, uh, the original title, it was Conan the Chimerian or Cimmerian, and they were related to the Scythians, and those people happened to live just north of the Black Sea. So that one tiny kernel of truth uh, about the completely fictional story is uh, such that one can say, yeah, Conan was Ukrainian uh, or a proto-Ukrainian from this period. So that's just for fun. Now we're gonna get back to the real history. Um, Ukraine uh, is not only on East and West trade routes, it's also on North and South trade routes. So again, these navigable waters uh, you can see are uh, depicted on these, uh, some of these posted stamps from modern Ukraine. Uh, this is the Dnipro River. This is uh, Kiev, the capital. And these north-south routes, this is also the River Don, another north-south route, route uh, connected the Vikings all the way down to the Black Sea. So this was a very important set of trade routes uh, for the people of this time. And uh, again, here we see more modern postal history links to, uh, to Scandinavia. This is uh, a, a letter written to the Danish Red Cross in Copenhagen. Uh, this is um, postmarked in Kiev. This is from the World War I era. Um, this is also fr from actually the, the uh, turn of the century. This is a newspaper uh, wrapper uh, with a, a, um, a postal stationery, uh, also postmarked in Kiev. And, uh, going to Denmark or Sweden, Lund, Sweden. You see at this time, uh, the, uh, the Ukrainian language um, begin with the journey of St. Cyril and Methodius from Greece uh, to Ukraine and, and parts east from there. Uh, the alphabet uh, is something that I learned uh, as a young child. And so you can see St. Cyril and Methodius. So this is why we call it the Cyrillic alphabet. It's after St. Cyril. Um, and these letters are uh, make up the alphabet. Now, Ukrainian and Russian are different. Uh, they use a, 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 a similar um, uh, alphabet, but actually the language is quite different, syntactically different. So uh, I'm not a linguist, but you, if you know uh, sentence structures, that's what I mean by syntax, and they are very different, although the, the alphabets look a little bit similar. And people that can read both uh, Ukrainian and Russian or one or the other usually can tell the difference between the two just by looking at the few differences in letters uh, that are there. So here we see uh, a Greek stamp honoring St. Cyril and Methodius, a Polish stamp, and also a Ukrainian stamp. Kiev and Rus uh, is the sort of uh, original uh, empire, really, uh, that is the hallmark of the great, the first great state of Ukraine. Um, Vladimir the Great made Christianity the official state religion at that time. Um, here he is depicted on stamps of both the Vatican uh, and on uh, Ukrainian stamps. Um, Volodymyr Veliki also um, started using the herald of Ukraine, what's called the trident, which you see here. This is on a, a coin uh, of this era. It's about a thousand year old uh, coin. And uh, later it was developed into this uh, symbol here. Now, when you think of a trident, you think of maybe Greece and Poseidon and navigable water routes. That's what I always thought it was, but as a matter of fact, uh, this is a falcon that is swooping downward. Um, 
and that's where the Ukrainian Herald comes from. So you can see that here, the two wings and the bird flying downward. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff, but uh, originates from many, many centuries ago. Okay, uh, if any of you ever played Risk, uh, the board game Risk, uh, it's, it's really fun. It was fun to play this as a kid because you realize that Ukraine is the largest country in Europe. And oh my goodness, why is that? Well, it refers to this period of Kiev and Rus when all these lands north of the Black Sea were uh, ruled by Kiev um, uh, in this period. So uh, the golden age uh, of this uh of this state was such that there were many of these principalities who were ruled by uh, Kiev and uh, as an essentially a, 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 an empire, it was the largest in Europe at that time. And this era had its rulers. Uh, this is uh, Danilo Halichki. Um, you can see here the, the emblem of the city of Lviv, which is where my, my parents are from near there. Um, you see a lot of reporting from there uh, today. It's close to the Polish border. Um, here we also see a, a Ukrainian stamp with uh, a warrior of Prince Oleg from this era. And, uh, and uh, Princess Anna, who married a French king and became the queen of France during this period. So you can see the links to Europe are, are very well established um, in this, you know, basically a thousand years ago. However, that first state of Ukraine uh, did not end well. It was sacked by the Mongols in about 20 or about 1250. Um, the Mongolian empire, uh, went across the, the steppes to the west, uh, all the way from Mongolia. Genghis Khan himself never set foot in Ukraine, but he sent uh, armies and soldiers and sort of waves of uh, invaders on horseback uh, through the steppes uh, to, uh, they sacked Kiev and made it all the way to Vienna. Uh, and this was the beginning of the decline of that first great uh, empire of Ukraine. So here you see stamps of Mongolia um, honoring Genghis Khan. And that was of course uh, before Islam uh, became uh, a, a big player, but later uh, about 1300, uh, the Crimean Khanate actually became the first Khanate to adopt Islam, Islam as the official state religion. Uh, so there is, a, this is uh, Roxolana, uh, a Ukrainian princess who married uh, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire uh, and um, honored on a stamp here of Ukraine. Here we see a Crimean uh, soldier uh, of the era. And here we see again, a more modern uh, postal history piece uh, from the city of Simferopol in, in Crimea. And it says right here on the postmark, Ak Meskid, which means little white mosque. So there are, there are for sure mosques in Crimea um, uh, from as early as uh, 1314. Um, and so you see the presence of uh, this religion uh, in Ukraine as well. Moving into the Middle Ages, we see um, the rise of the Polish Lithuanian Empire, which some of you may not have heard of, uh, but it became also the largest state in Europe at that time. Um, it was uh, the, the Grand Duke of Lithuania branched out all the way to uh, Ukraine uh, and parts of Ukraine were ruled by uh, Polish and Lithuanian aristocracy. Here you see uh, a stamp by the famous stamp designer Czesław Slania. This is actually an essay uh, for a stamp that, that later became a Polish stamp. Um, this is the Battle, Battle of Grunwald um, in which the Poles and Lithuanians um, 
beat the uh, the Teutonic Knights, uh, uh, the Germans essentially, and established themselves uh, and parts of Eastern Europe and Ukraine, uh, again, as the, the largest empire in Europe during this period. And here you see some stamps of Ukraine and also Lithuania um, honoring various aspects of uh, th that period. Okay, the Zaporizhian siege and the Cossack uh, Hetmanate um, were two political entities that were born out of uh, su southern and eastern Ukraine. Um, uh, the Cossack Hetmanate uh, did have the world's first written constitution of its type, um, which is honored here on some postal stationery of Ukraine. Um, here you see the very famous painting by Ilya Repin um, of the Cossacks writing a letter to the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, basically declaring their independence uh, from the Ottoman Empire and telling him to go stick it. Um, this is a, a famous Cossack, uh, le legendary Cossack Mamai. Uh, uh, which is um, in, referred to in, in many songs and uh, literature of the era. Um, and here you see uh, an early stamp of Ukraine actually from 1990, uh, honoring the 500 years of Kazakhs, Kazakhdom in Ukraine. Now, Kazakhdom was uh, you know, a little bit imperfect, shall we say, there was, um, uh, th there were, there were there were pogroms. Uh, they they were uh, they were you know kind of a militaristic society out of necessity, um, and so uh, even though they were the first to use the 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 word Ukraine uh, to to refer to the country that it established, uh, first the siege and then the hetmanate, um, uh, and uh, had a definitely has a lasting leg legacy in Ukrainian culture and other cultures as well. Okay, you might be asking yourself, well, where's Russia in all of this? Um, well, they were, they were a little late to the party. Muscovy uh, and the area around Moscow did not become a major political entity until uh, the 18th century. Uh, and so you see here stamps of uh, depicting uh, various historical things from that era. The, the first thing that Moscow did when they rose to power in the area is start banning uh, the Ukrainian language. Um, here you see here a list in 1720, Peter the First degree, uh, decree uh, banning the printing press in the Ukrainian language banning Ukrainian texts and, and seized church books. Peter II ordered to rewrite all decrees and orders uh, from Ukrainian into Russian. Catherine decreed banning the teaching of Ukrainian at the Kiev Mohila Academy in Kiev, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so pretty much from their start, they were very unkind to Ukraine and uh, the Ukrainian language and tried to destroy its culture. Here you see the Herald of Moscow on a stamp of Russia. Here you see old Moscow. Here you see Catherine the Great. Okay, the Pale of Settlement, um, which you may or may not have heard, heard of was a decree uh, by Catherine that said, basically said, Jews can settle here. And it turns out that the Pale of Settlement stretching again all the way from the Baltics to the Black Sea, it turns out that about half of the Pale of Settlement is in Ukraine and about half of Ukraine comprises part of the Pale of Settlement. So there's definitely a crossover here as you can see here in my sort of Venn diagram. Um, so there was definitely Jewish culture uh, very much alive uh, during this time and previous to this time. Um, we see some recent stamps of Ukraine uh, honoring Jewish culture. 
This is a um, synagogue outside of Lviv, which I'll, I'll get back to in a second. Here's some uh, Jewish uh, folk dancing, and here is a uh, uh, a clothier uh, who, who's, uh, make uh, using a um, a sewing machine and you can see it actually so i don't know if you can see it but i can see it, it actually says singer on here as the brand so this is a um an occupation that would be familiar uh to a lot of folks um th there's also a stamp of israel here uh, honoring rabbi nachman of, of breslev uh which is the originator of much of uh orthodox judaism uh which is in ukraine uh so back to the synagogue, I was, I was actually, I actually went to this town. This is a town outside of a field called uh, Jokio when I was there in 2019. And this synagogue that's depicted here was destroyed. Um, and it's still sitting there in it's completely destroyed state. Um, really remarkable to see uh, something like that as a, um, uh, you know, a, a, a physical record of war. Um, so it's very incredible to see that. Um, and it is, it's still there. Um, a very, very interesting uh, cultural tourism that I did when I was there in 2019. Okay, you all remember the Crimean War, right? Um, the Crimean War, uh, was between the United Kingdom, uh, or I should say the, 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 the allies of the uh, United Kingdom, France, Ottoman Empire, and Sardinia, uh, who allied to prevent Russian expansion into the Black Sea at Crimea. They fought to protect religious minorities uh, in the shrinking Ottoman Empire, so the Ottoman Empire is in decline at this time. And the Treaty of Paris, which ended the war, forbade Russia from basing warships in the Black Sea at the Crimean Peninsula. Uh, we see stamps here of Russia and Poland. Um, I'm not going to get into too much of this detail. Uh, they look very similar at this time. Um, this is also a Zemstvo stamp, meaning a local post uh, from Kharkiv. Um, these are examples of items that are relatively easy to obtain, uh, if you know how. This is um, a stamp from a a uh, steamship that would have been operating in the Black Sea. Um, and then here's a more recent uh, contemporary Crimean War uh, commemorative uh, stamps from uh, the Crimean War from the UK. Okay, so the Ukrainian question at the time of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and the Russian Empire. So you can see in this small inset map that around the turn of the century, 1900, uh, Ukraine was uh, split into essentially two parts. Um, the Russian part controlled by the, the Russian Empire and then Austro-Hungarian Empire, which of course stretches more to the West. Um, and in this period, uh, Ukrainian culture and literature uh, flourished. And the people that started talking about um, what does it mean to be Ukrainian? What does it mean to have Ukrainian history, Ukrainian literature, Ukrainian culture? Are some of these people depicted on these stamps of uh, Ukraine and the Soviet Union and um, uh, basically, basically those. And, and the, so this is the, a stamp of the Austrian crown uh, this is Markian Shishkevich, who uh, wrote uh, literature on the idea of the Ukrainian state and the idea of being ethnically Ukrainian. Uh, here are some stamps depicting Taras Shevchenko, young and old, who is known as the bard of Ukraine, who really sort of codified the Ukrainian language and song um, and did a lot of uh, literary works. Ironically, he also studied in um, St. Petersburg and, and elsewhere in the Russian Empire, but he is really credited for being uh, the person that uh, is probably the single most important um, uh, author uh, in the Ukrainian language. 
Uh, but there are others. There's also Lesha Ukrainka, uh, who um, also uh, wrote poetry. Um, and Mikhailo Hrushevsky, uh, who is a historian and became actually the first president of Ukraine in the early period, which we'll, we'll get to uh, in a bit. And also some uh, religious leaders like Mitropolit Andriy Sheptichki, uh, whom my grandfather studied under, as a matter of fact, uh, um, uh, and who was killed uh, by the Soviets in 1944. You see him here honored on a stamp of Ukraine. So Ukrainian culture really uh, flourished um, not only in the Austro-Hungarian Empire, um, but also in uh, the, the Russian sphere. And Ukrainian language became this sort of enigmatic uh, and important uh, symbol of uh, Ukrainian um, self-reliance and, um, and statehood eventually. Okay, World War I in Ukraine uh, explodes at this time. And you know Ukraine to be uh, you know, a, a battlefield uh, for the Austrian military, the Hungarian military, the German military who made it all the way to Kiev, um, the Russian military on the other side, uh, and then Russian provisional government after the uh, the, the rev revolution in Russia, um, Austrian occupation forces. So these were various um, occupiers um, all on the battlefront, which was in the territory of Ukraine. So here we see, this is a, a Russian military marking on a letter from Kiev. Um, these are from the pr provisional government uh, period you see um, uprated stamps also uh, postmarked in, in Kiev here. Uh, this is going to uh, the International Bureau of Peace in Bern, Switzerland uh, from Kiev. Uh, this is a, a German military marking uh, on a stamp from Kiev. Uh, this is again around 1916. And also a postcard here of the Ukrainian Sichevistriuchi, which were um, uh, an Austrian uh, division uh, that were were um, that were basically Ukrainian. And so this is a field postcard. It's got a censorship marking on it, and it's postmarked uh, here with an Austrian stamp. And this is uh, Memorial Poppy from the UK. In the brief period uh, after uh, the war, uh, Ukraine declared its independence. Um, it did not last very long. It lasted uh, only about uh, two years. There were actually uh, three separate governments that were formed. It was you know, very chaotic time, obviously, in, in the, the aftermath of war. There was you know, definitely a power vacuum. You see here uh, the Ukrainian trident. Uh, which was overprinted on Russian stamps. Uh, this one here is one of my favorites with the, the pink and green. Uh, there were stamps issued, um, or I should say stamps prepared, but never really released to the public. So you see a lot of these in, in collectors' hands. Um, and this period of overprinting the, the trident onto stamps of Russia is sort of the, the classic uh, thing that uh, Ukrainian stamp collectors collect. There's a lot of variety and it's very detailed and um, uh, uh, an interesting uh, period to collect. Uh, a little difficult because there's all sorts of um, things that are not particularly well documented. Much better, they are much better now, but when, uh, uh, with modern Ukrainian uh, philately. Um, and stamp collecting, but uh, it's a very interesting period. And this was so. This was the um, uh, the period right after World War One, where Ukraine declared independence. Had, like I said, three different governments, um, but eventually fell to the Soviets. So you learn in usually in in school about the Russian Revolution, but that's kind of misnamed because. It's actually the Soviet Revolution uh, that happened, uh, the Bolshevik Revolution and the Soviet Revolution after the war. 
Uh, and it happened not only in Russia, but in Belarus, and Ukraine, and uh, all over what later became uh, the Soviet Union and the Soviet Empire. So here we see this the situation uh, in Ukraine after the war. So this is about spring of 1919. So again, that power vacuum that I was talking about in the last slide, the there were uh, the white army was there. Uh, France was in the area trying to protect Crimea and these areas. Uh, part of this was uh, uh, Romania, uh, Poland, Czechoslovakia, et cetera. Just small bits and pieces of this. The Ukrainian State Directorate, one of the, the, of the three governments formed at that time, held a small area. This map is very rough. It's not meant to uh, be um, uh, detailed in any way, but you can see some of the detail the, uh, and, and the Bolsheviks were in the north and eventually uh, took over. So here you see the early stamps of, uh, it was actually originally called the R Russian Soviet Federated Socialist Republic, later changed to the USSR. Uh, so you see here uh, stamps, this is 5,000 rubles overprinted uh, on a 20 ruble stamp. You see the hammer and sickle, uh, you see the worker design. This is from uh, a town uh, called Bed Bedichev, um, an industrial uh, area, which is in the Donbass, uh, in the east of Ukraine. You see the hammer and sickle and the, the chain breaker. So these were the, some of the original stamps of the Soviet Union, which were then used. And you can see the kind of conditions that, you know, that these travel under. Um, a lot of these markings are, are worn off. This was you know, from a time of war and that right in the aftermath of war, things weren't running so smoothly. So material from this era is pretty beat up for obvious reasons. Okay, between World War I and World War II, Ukraine was divided into uh, four separate areas. There was the part that was controlled by uh, the Soviet Union. So Ukraine became the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, which is this area. Um, this part, which was formerly the Austro-Hungarian part, was uh, became a part of Poland. Uh, this little chunk became part of Czechoslovakia. This little chunk became part of Romania. And so you can find examples of you know, the cities in these areas um, using the appropriate stamps of that country. Um, so here's a Polish stamp. This is a, uh, as you know, there was inflation during this time. So here you see a, a Polish postcard with three stamps on it. I forget what the original denomination was, but they're overprinted with 10,000, um, I guess it was uh, zloty, 10,000 zloty uh, stamps. So that's, you know, 30,000 zloty to send uh, a postcard. Um, that's quite a bit. And during that rampant inflation period where, you know, they just kept adding zeros to things. Uh, here's a postal card from uh, Mukachevo, which is, again, you see the bilingual postmarks here. It's in uh, Roman or Latin characters here and Ukrainian here, Mukachevo. Um, this is from uh, Carpathian uh, Ukraine. And here are stamps from Chernovich, uh, which is here. Uh, in the Romanian part using Romanian stamps. So this period lasted uh, from until after World War I till to right before uh, World War II. And this is the period in which uh, actually right before this was uh, the period where my grandparents uh, and parents were born in this area here. Okay, also between the wars uh, was uh, the beginning of the Soviet uh, um, terror, as it's called, um, in lands of Ukraine uh, because of the um, policies, uh, political policies of collectivization. There was a genocide known as the Holodomor, which was perpetrated by the government against uh, farmers and people in the villages. Uh, so you see here my famous flying yam postcard, which is basically a, a Soviet propaganda card. Uh, this is actually not a flying yam. It's a, it's a sugar beet, but I call it the flying yam just because just because I do. This is from Zaporizhia. Um, and again, the idea of collectivization is that the farmers farm and then the politicians come and take all the food and bring it to the cities and disperse it into the cities. 
you know, which is great, but unfortunately it was a policy that meant a lot of people starved while um, a lot of other people um, ate the good food. And so this is commemorated on a stamp of Ukraine here known as the Holodomor, which means death by hunger or death by starvation um, uh, on a stamp, uh, on a more recent stamp of Ukraine. These were actually um, fundraising stamps issued in the period, um, semi-postals you would call them, uh, that actually raised money for the same people that the, they were starving, which is kind of odd. Here you see a, a lovely Lenin stamp on a, a stamp of the Soviet Union, CCCP. So you see these CCCP stands for um, Sovietsky Soyuz Socialna Respublika, approximately, uh, or Soviet Union, USSR. This translates to USSR. Okay, um, as World War II was sneaking up on Europe, so to speak, there was the Molotov-Ribbentrop uh, Pact uh, on the eve of World War II, uh, where um, the German Nazi government and the Soviet Union basically signed an agreement where they would divide Poland between the two of them. Um, and um, so this, this period was September of 1939 through June of 1941. Uh, so they did that. Um, Germany, Nazi Germany invaded Poland from the West and Soviet Union invaded Poland from the East. They carved up the country um, into those, those areas. Um, my mom was born during this Period. She was born in or right before this, May of 1939, uh, in the Polish part uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. Um, and so here we see a letter bearing Polish stamps from this period. This is from the view in 1941, uh, looks like February of 1941, um, going to Wichita, Kansas. Uh, this is a Carpatho Ukrainian stamp. Uh, this is sad little story. The part of Ukraine that was um, part of Czechoslovakia uh, declared independence in the morning and were overrun by the Nazis by the afternoon. So they issued a stamp to commemorate their independence, which le lasted literally hours. Um, and here are some stamps of the Soviet Union again from this period. Okay, and then uh, Nazi Germany decided to renege on their pact and, and invaded the Soviet Union. So when you hear Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, right, first, first stop on that journey is Ukraine, uh, becomes a battlefield again. Um, so here you see, as this is happening, the approximate areas of, of control around fall of, uh, 1942, this is basically as far as the Germans got west, the extent of the front was approximately here. Um, this was the formerly the Soviet zone um, of Ukraine. You see uh, Romanians who were allied with Nazi Germany as well take over this area. Um, and at various points, the front kept moving uh, this way to the east. Um, Here's a card uh, with uh, a prisoner of war card uh, with, the, with the Nazi uh, markings and censorship markings on them. Uh, they actually, even the Germans actually divided this area into, into two, two different uh, services. This was considered to be part of Germany, um, this area approximately here. And then the German Dienstpost was kind of more of a, a military uh, post. So if you were living in these areas, you could use the post, you know, somewhat, um, uh, but they were literally uh, different jurisdictions. Uh, this is a bisected stamp, you know, again, during conditions of war, um, you have to utilize the resources that you have. So uh, this stamp was cut in half to be used on, on you know, because they, they didn't have whatever, 10 cent stamps, so they, cut them in half and made two five cent stamps, that sort of thing. 
uh, happened here. Um, was there collaboration with uh, Ukrainian patriots with the Nazis? Yes, there was. Uh, it's well documented. Um, you know, a, a terrible mistake, uh, clearly, um, but a very small part of the history of Ukraine. Um, here you see a Ukrainian stamp uh, honoring uh, Babi Yar Memorial, uh, which uh, was a terrible calamity that happened outside of uh, Kiev, where many uh, tens of thousands, if not more, I don't actually know the exact number, uh, were, were killed, uh, Jews, in the Holocaust uh, and elsewhere uh, all along the front. Okay, well, we know the history of World War II. We know who became victorious in the end. It was uh, the UK, the Soviet Union, and the United States. Uh, so here you see some materials from that period. You see these triangular folded letters, which are soldiers' letters. This has got the CCCP. Uh, again, this is, you know, depending on the time and the place, you have um, uh, postmarks of the occupying countries. So in this case, it's the Soviet Union. Uh, here is a uh, Ukrainian, modern Ukrainian stamp uh, uh, issued to commemorate the war dead. Here's, Here's some uh, Soviet planes and Soviet uh, victory parades with the image of Stalin and the red flag. Okay, 1945, the war ended. And in the period after World War II, um, Ukraine was uh, part of the Soviet Union, again, in, in, in whole. Um, uh, Khrushchev, uh, made sure Crimea became part of Ukraine at this time. It was sort of a gift to the Ukrainians. Uh, you see heavy industry during this period. So covering a lot of years here, including the Cold War. Uh, here's a great 1970s stamp with the, the hammer and sickle. Uh, you've got Lenin and Stalin. Uh, this is a stamp of the uh, DDR or Dutch Democratic Republic, right? East Germany. Um, you do see, you know, not everything was terrible under the Soviets. You do see this is the um, uh, the, the a dam in the Dnipro, uh, which is a uh, uh, hydroelectric plant, which is uh, still generating electricity today, I do believe, um, on the stamp of the Soviet Union, most of the, the stamp of the Soviet Union, again, with the uh, hammer and sickle. So a little foreshadowing here, we have the beginning of the atomic age also in this period, right after uh, World War II. Um, and so you see stamps here of the United Nations and of the Soviet Union, Czechoslovakia, again, uh, uh, German Democratic Republic or East Germany uh, in being involved in the space race, uh, being involved in nuclear testing. So if you remember in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s, uh, the environment uh, was uh, of prime importance to many people. And uh, they thought that, you know, maybe nuclear power and nuclear bombs were not such a great idea. And so these ideas uh, were promoted by some. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the space race and, and all that was another avenue of uh, science and technology. Uh, being used for um, purposes uh, that were generally peaceful. Um, like, again, I'm just foreshadowing here a little bit. Want to be able to get to your questions, so I'm going to move along. So in 1986 was the disaster at uh, Chernobyl nuclear uh, plant here honored on the stamp of Ukraine. Uh, also these sort of anti-nuclear sentiments on a stamp of Belarus uh, where the, that, that is very near uh, the, the Ukraine Belarus border. Um, Soviet uh, uh, stamps, uh, you know, basically anti-nuclear, anti anti-atomic. Uh, and then here is also a 1991 stamp. This is among the last stamps of the Soviet Union um, here honoring Chernobyl as well, looks from an environmental standpoint. 
when I say honoring, I mean commemorating the, um, the disaster. So in 1989 and 1990, the Berlin Wall falls um, and you can see some of the, the uh, last stamps of the, of the Soviet Union uh, promoting Perestroika and Glasnost, uh, which was sort of the, you know, th theoretical um, uh, political philosophy underpinnings of um, uh, ending the Soviet Union. Uh, here's Mikhail Gorbachev on a stamp of Norway. Um, and these are actually some fantasy stamps in the, uh, in the tradition of sort of overprinting things. So uh, that happened during this time. Uh, there are other people who are experts in collecting stamps of that era. I'm not, so I'm just kind of calling that out on myself. I really don't know too much about these. Um, and in 1991, of course, Ukraine declares independence from the Soviet Union. You see here a stamp commemorating some of the first stamps of Ukraine. Uh, and again, history repeats itself. These are trident overprints on uh, stamps of the Soviet Union, because again, you use whatever materials are all available. There are Soviet stamps in the post office. So you're gonna overprint them with the Ukrainian trident and make them available. So that lasted uh, for a couple of years during, again, this sort of tumultuous period. Here we see the, the modern flag of Ukraine adopted with uh, the, um, uh, the Trident as well, United Nations stamps. And again, more, uh, this is another uh, definitive stamp of Ukraine with the yellow wheat and the blue sky, which is what the yellow and blue uh, stands for actually, is the wheat fields and the sky. And in doing so, uh, in declaring its independence, uh, Ukraine became the third largest nuclear military power sort of by default because as part of the Soviet Union, it had um, nuclear missiles uh, on their territory and outside of uh, what then later became uh, Russia and, and, and the United States uh, being the two biggest powers, Ukraine suddenly became the third largest nuclear power. But the Ukrainians decided that, that it was too risky to have that with the recent memory of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. They were very much on the side of anti-nuclear. And so Ukraine signed the Budapest Memorandum in 1994, uh, the Budapest Memorandum on Security Assurances on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. And they essentially gave up their nuclear weapons in exchange for protection. The uh, security guarantees. The uh, signatories of the Budapest Memorandum are Ukraine, United States, the United Kingdom, and the Russian Federation. You see their flags here. And again, the basic idea here was that they didn't want to have uh, nuclear installations uh, in the country. In 2004, uh, there was what was known as the, uh, the Orange Revolution. Um, I'm not gonna get into the, the details, too many of the details of modern history here, but Russia has been uh, attempting to be an influencer in Ukraine for a long time, basically since independence. Uh, and so that resulted in the Orange Revolution of 2004. And again, the Maidan Revolution of 2014, in which was overthrown a essentially a, a, a puppet Russian uh, dictator who was, although he was elected supposedly um, uh, uh, through legal means, uh, it was pretty clear after he fled to Russia um, that uh, after the revolution that um, he was not a friend of the Ukrainian people. And uh, here you see some stamps commemorating those events, which brings us sort of right up until the present. Um, in 2014, Russia invaded Eastern Ukraine and began its occupation of Crimea. Uh, here you see some Ukrainian military equipment and um, you see here these stamps that depict, uh, you know, coming up right to the present, a soldier wearing both a COVID mask and a military uniform here in the center. And uh, as you know, the current war, uh, you know, 
been going on for eight years, essentially, but this is a major escalation what's happened in the past several weeks. So that kind of brings you up to date uh, on that. And uh, what conclusions can we draw from this? Uh, the history of Ukraine is complex and fascinating. Uh, Ukraine has always been multicultural and multi-ethnic. We see the presence of the, uh, of, of the three major monotheistic religions in Ukraine, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, as well as ties to regional and major world history narratives. Uh, and also stamps illustrate the process of cultural memory, public art, which is one of the reasons that, that I collect stamps. And I hope this was a fascinating talk for you all. Um, and I hope you learned a lot. I'll take your questions in a second. Uh, it occurred to me to add this slide. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is very well um, uh, uh, written about in Sethe Plachy's The Gates of Europe, uh, which came out uh, just a few years ago. This is an excellent book if anyone wants to follow up and learn more. And then pretty much anything by Timothy Snyder is also very good. Uh, Sed Sedhi Plachy is... Uh, from uh, Harvard, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute. Um, and Timothy Snyder is from Yale. So these are two excellent sources of information for people who wanna learn more uh, about that. So I wanna thank you for coming to this presentation and we got a couple minutes for questions. So that is fantastic. All right, thank you, Andrew. Um, I will facilitate the questions for you and we'll get to as many as we can. If we run out of time, I will drop Andrew's email in the chat and you can please feel free to reach out to Andrew at your convenience. All right, first question. Is the Ukraine known for beautiful stamps? Uh, it is actually. Uh, the Ukrainian stamp program is fantastic. Uh, Ukrainian culture and literature and art uh, flourishes uh, in independent Ukraine. Uh, Ukraine are very proud people. Uh, I have a funny little story about this, actually a personal story. When Ukraine uh, declared itself independent in 1991, my uh, great uncle um, heard about it on the radio and that day and said, his first words out of his mouth were, finally, Ukraine is going to be able to issue its own postage stamps and essentially tell its own story. Um, so uh, yes, the Ukrainian stamp program uh, has been pretty incredible. Um, some beautiful stamps, as, as you can see, I used a lot of them here to illustrate and they are quite beautiful and interesting. The very first uh, stamps of Ukraine were designed by Hehari Narbut, uh, who's uh, an amazing uh, designer. Um, but that was in the 1918 period. All right, um, next question. Was the Ukraine affected by the Black Death Plague in the 1200s and 1300s? Um, I don't know too much about uh, the Black Death or the plague in the Middle Ages, so I, I can't really answer that one. Okay. Um, does the Trident icon still resonate with the average Ukrainian today, or is it somewhat archaic by now? Uh, yeah, the 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 Trizub, the um, uh, the Ukrainian uh, Trident symbol is all over the place. It's the it's still the national symbol of Ukraine, um, and and yes, very much resonates with the Ukrainian people. Even though it's over a thousand years old, it's it's been updated. Okay, next one. Can you comment upon the Snake Island Russian ship uh, go bleed yourself stamp that was issued yesterday? Yeah, it is. Uh, you know whether the stamp is actually going to be issued uh, is is a question. Um, it's a 
a, you know, an interesting story um, and kind of hilarious, but we'll see that stamp is a currently is an essay, which means it's a it's a proposed design. Uh, it hasn't actually been issued for use in postage. And my understanding is that the uh, Postal Service in Ukraine, as we speak, um, is shut down for obvious reasons due to conditions of war. So you're probably not going to see that other than online uh, anytime soon. Right. Um, does Ukraine still use those re-stamped um, Russian stamps or have they become a collector's item? Yeah. Um, thanks, Bibiana. Those were, uh, those are um, uh, collector's items now. Uh, the, the stamps of both from, from the 1991 uh, period are, are, uh, are collected uh, by many. Um, and because again, they sort of mirror the 1918 period um, where they did the same. Um, so, so yes, they are, they are collector's items and not currently used. Stamps of Ukraine are currently used. How did you get started with collecting stamps? Uh, that's a great story. So um, when I was about seven years old, I, uh, my, my, my father got me started collecting. He was more of a coin collector, but wanted to introduce us to a number of things, living in Skokie, Illinois, um, uh, and uh, elsewhere. The very first stamp show I went to was uh, at Niles at the YMCA by the Leaning Tower of Pisa there, if you know that one. Um, uh, as a child, about seven years old, I started collecting stamps. And, um, you know, I collected worldwide stamps, you know, here, you know, I would, would go acquire some stamps. It's like, here's a stamp of Poland, here's a stamp of France, here's a stamp of uh, Jamaica. Uh, and, and then I asked my parents, well, where are the stamps of Ukraine? And they said, well, they're sort of kind of these stamps that say CCCP or Soviet Union on them, but those aren't really Ukrainian stamps yada, yada, yada. And of course, my, that's when my curiosity was piqued to learn all about this country that, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the 70s and uh, it was part of the Soviet Union. So sort of a country, but sort of not a country. And so that was the beginning of my learning and understanding of uh, what it means to be Ukrainian, uh, et cetera, uh, here in the States. All right, we just have just two minutes left and we have a bunch of questions remaining. So um, Andrew, do you have any closing remarks but also for those who submitted questions, please take a moment to see in the chat. I did leave Andrew's contact information if you would like further discussion, but with one minute remaining, I will pass it over to Andrew for closing remarks. Thank you all for joining us. Yeah, thank you uh, for coming. I'd also like to thank, I was gonna do this in the beginning, I forgot, so I'll do it now. Uh, I'd like to thank the Chicago Philatelic Society, uh, which is the oldest continuously operating stamp collecting club in the United States, who prompted me to um, arrange uh, uh, this collection to begin with. So the first time I gave this presentation was to the Chicago Philatelic Society. I'd also like to thank um, the Ukrainian Institute of Modern Art, who, uh, for whom I delivered uh, this presentation back in August for the 30th anniversary of Ukrainians' independence. So thank you very much uh, to them and also to the Illinois Holocaust Museum for helping support uh, that and, and sponsor that as well. And uh, for and thank you, Rahim, also, and, and everyone at the Illinois Holocaust Museum that uh, helped this put this presentation in a rather nimble fashion uh, in the in, just in the past couple of weeks. So uh, thank you all for being here. All right, thank you again, Andrew, and thank you all in attendance. I hope you all have a great rest of your day.